Hey guys, I'm Manar Mohawash and thank you again for joining me today for Mint Press News' Behind the Headline, a citizen-led project created in partnership with Free Speech TV. Now to continue to produce high-quality, independent content, we depend on citizen sponsors. So to learn more about this, visit our website at mintpressnews.com. Now let's get Behind the Headline. When we hear about the civil rights movement, we often don't think of the disabled, but it's a demographic that has been fighting to live freely in American communities for over 50 years. And their struggle is rarely heard in the mainstream media. They've received far less attention than the fight for racial justice for African Americans and equality for LGBT communities. But their cries for equality can be heard today, nationwide. Their slogan is simple, we'd rather go to jail than die in a nursing home. That's because, like so many other social justice issues, this struggle is about profiteering off of America's most vulnerable, with a powerful nursing lobby leading the effort to quash their civil rights. About one in five Americans have a disability, and over 24 million are severely disabled. Now, the New York Times recently reported that of the nearly one and a half million Americans in nursing homes, about 200,000 are good candidates to live independently. But the American Healthcare Association, for example, which has some of the deepest pockets in the nursing home industry spent nearly a million dollars on lobbying as of April this year to prevent that. The policies they support force thousands into institutions that could live independent lives and keep wages low for the personal care attendants that keep the disabled living in their communities. Some were born with disabilities that limit their mobility or motor control, while others have been disabled by medical conditions, strokes, or even car accidents. And as the population ages, more and more people will need help to remain in their homes. But the Disability Integration Act, a bill sponsored by Senator Chuck Schumer from New York, could change lives by making access to community-based services a human right. It's a reform that's been a long time in coming, but since the movement began, the disabled haven't been afraid to take extreme measures to be heard. They've organized sit-ins and blockades of buses to get their message across, and dozens are routinely arrested at their annual protests in Washington. Now, the disability rights movement began in 1960, when Ed Roberts, a quadriplegic man, became the first severely disabled student to attend from the University of California at Berkeley. And as a student, he began organizing support services and housing that opened the door to other disabled students. And in 1972, he helped found the first Center for Independent Living, a model for helping disabled people live independently, still used worldwide. One of the most effective disability rights groups active today, ADAPT, traces its origins to 1983, when Reverend Wade Blank, a former civil rights activist, helped a group of disabled people in a Denver nursing home create accessible housing. Now, years of direct action pressured the government to pass passed the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, and transit systems everywhere adopted wheelchair lifts thanks to the work of groups like ADAPT. Although the ADA requires states to offer services to the disabled, it left the door open for the powerful nursing home lobby to collect more federal funding while essentially imprisoning the disabled. Many, especially those on Medicaid, are allowed extremely limited freedom, strictly confined to institutions for all about one or two days a week. Accessible communities became the next goal of the movement. Throughout the 26 years since the passage of the ADA, ADAPT and their allies have protested in Washington and in their home states. They've even targeted the annual convention of the American Healthcare Association, taking over meeting spaces and their hotel. The Disability Integration Act would mandate that states provide more accessible housing and funding for personal care attendants who help with everyday tasks like cooking and bathing. Now, last year in Texas, which pays some of the country's lowest wages to attendants, disability rights and labor activists occupied the governor's office, but only succeeded in raising base wages to $8 an hour. Now, under the DIA, states would also be forced to pay living wages for those attendants who are overwhelmingly female and mostly minorities. Now, the current makeup of Congress leaves activists fighting an uphill battle for passages of bills like the DIA. A lot is riding on this next election, which could shake up both the House and the Senate. Of course, about $500,000 of American Healthcare Association spending went directly to congressional candidates and was almost evenly split 
between both Democratic and Republican parties. So regardless of whether seats are occupied by Democrats or Republicans, they'll likely be taking money from the nursing home lobby. Maybe that's why groups like ADAPT focus more on issues than on candidates and political parties. These are human lives, and the stakes are high. Whether or not a bill like the DIA becomes law this year or years from now, it's safe to say that disabled people will continue in their own civil rights movement, even if it means taking jail time, and even if the public isn't paying much attention. Tens of thousands of people in Bhopal, India have died as a result of a massive leak of poisonous gas in 1982 at the hands of Dow Chemical. This became known as the worst industrial disaster in human history. And the fight for justice to these victims and the survivors is at the doors of the Department of Justice today. Now, The disaster highlighted how the DOJ is literally blocking foreign legal systems from taking action against U.S. corporations and allowing them to get away with crimes against humanity. So here's what happened. On December 3, 1984, the people of Bhopal were awakened just after midnight to screams of pain and clouds of poisonous gas stemming from a leak at a Union Carbide plant. One survivor, Champa Devi Chukla, said breathing the gas felt like somebody had filled our bodies up with red chilies, and by morning, the streets were piled high with bodies. Victims died in agony, coughing and vomiting. Women miscarried as they ran in terror through the streets. Others were crushed to death by panicked people and livestock. And according to the Indian Council for Medical Research, half a million people were harmed in that disaster. And at least 3,000 people died that single night. Some estimates suggest as many as nearly 10,000 people died just in the first two weeks. And another 8,000 have died of diseases like cancer and respiratory problems in the years since. Now, activists and survivors are still struggling for justice for what's considered history's worst industrial disaster. Disaster. Now, under a 1989 settlement, survivors received only about $500 each, and Union Carbide was absolved of any responsibility despite evidence that it repeatedly cut corners on safety. And in 1999, Dow Chemical purchased Union Carbide, hampering the quest for justice. Now, activists say the U.S. Department of Justice is protecting Dow from being forced to appear before India's courts on manslaughter charges. And on May 15th, the International Campaign for Justice in Bhopal launched a WhiteHouse.gov petition demanding that the DOJ stop standing in the way of justice. The petition received over 6,000 signatures in just four days, but needs 100,000 signatures to receive a response from the Obama administration. And today, I'm joined by Rachna Dingra, who co-leads the Bhopal Group for Information and Action. And I began by asking her to explain the charges facing Dow. Check it out. Union Carbide Corporation USA, who has been facing charges of culpable homicide uh, since 1992, has decided, uh, manslaughter, has decided not to show up. They just have not showed up. And that this was the case with Warren Anderson also, who was the CEO of Union Carbide Corporation, who recently passed away last year as a free man. And Dow Chemical Company, which bought over Union Carbide in 2001, is also facing several uh, cases in India. They are facing cases for uh, cleanup of the contamination. Uh, they are facing cases for paying more compensation to people who died as a result of a disaster and who suffered injuries. And most importantly, uh, Bhopal courts have sent three notices four notices to Dow Chemical to appear in the ongoing criminal case against Union Carbide in which they are being asked that why won't you make your 100% subsidiary appear in the Bhopal court and they have ignored all notices in fact in fact Department of Justice, who is supposed to, of the U.S. government, who is supposed to serve these notices to Dow Chemical, has not really served any of, of these notices. So we not only are fighting this corporation that is based in U.S., but we are fighting the U.S. government also, which is totally helping this corporation that is uh, facing that is face, that is facing charges in this country. Right, and this obviously raises the question: I mean, how is the Department of uh, justice blocking the Indian legal system. Do Indian courts actually have any jurisdiction 
um, over U.S. corporations? Yes, uh, uh, it's a very good question. Yes, there is jurisdiction. Um, uh, uh, so between India and U.S., there is a treaty called Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, and that treaty was specifically made for this purpose, that if there is a foreign accused living in, whether it is in India or in U.S., and it's wanted uh, by the Indian courts, then under this treaty, Indian, go- Indian courts, ha- uh, through the Indian government, uh, and then to the U.S. government can request this person to be, uh, the n- notice to be sent so that this person can come and appear. So um, through following that treaty that the U.S. and India has, the four notices have been sent by the Bhopal court uh, to the Department of Justice. And Department of Justice has only responded to those one of those notices, and uh, and they have not really given any reason why they are not serving Dow, Dow Chemical. And repeatedly, we have seen that in the, in this treaty, this is a mutual legal assistance treaty. So they are supposed to assist each other. And here, what we see is that uh, Department of Justice assisting Dow and not assisting Government of India in uh, making sure that Dow appears here. Right. And, you know, Chachna, your story specifically is really interesting. Um, Tell our viewers and listeners, how did you learn about the Bhopal disaster and why did you decide to move to India uh, to help the survivors? So I heard about the uh, I had heard about the Bhopal disaster when I was young. We had studied it in school, but to me, like to most people, to me, the Bhopal disaster had, had uh, was probably over in '84. I heard about the disaster again in 2000 when uh, Bhopal, uh, Bhopal survivors had come to uh, Michigan to protest against the merger between carbide and Dow Chemical. I was a student at that time, uh, and that is when, as a student organization, I heard about it. And that's when I found out that things in Bhopal were actually worse, that nothing had been resolved, that people were still sick and people were still dying due to the result of the disaster, and that there was contamination, uh, which no one talked about or or knew. And, And at the same time, uh, at, at the same time, I got um, an offer. I went to the business school and I got an offer uh, to work. And my client happened to be Dow Chemical uh, at that time. And I thought I would work with them and see if I could bring a change from being in the inside. And I did that for two years. And I realized that, you know, corporations, or well, how much ever they talk about corporate social responsibility, that they do not... They do not have uh, a, they, they, they do not have a heart or a soul. Their only allegiance is to bottom line profit. So that is when uh, you know I quit that job and I moved to Bhopal for the first time and I decided to be part of the struggle that has been going on for many years for justice and a life of dignity. You've obviously done a lot of really great work to get the voices of these survivors heard. As someone who works so closely um, with the community there, how does Bhopal continue to suffer um, today as a result of this tragedy? Uh, Like I said earlier, this was not something that started and ended in 84. It is an ongoing disaster. Uh, So far, far more than 25,000 people have died as a result of the uh, illnesses caused due to the disaster. There is a a big population, uh, more than 100,000 people, that are still chronically sick because we do not know how to treat people who have been exposed uh, by the gas because the company refuses to reveal uh, the, the toxicology of the gases. So there is a health disaster, there is an uh, environment disaster that no one talks, uh, no, a lot, not a lot of people know about. And this actually has nothing to do with the gas disaster. This is about thousands of tons of toxic waste that Union Carbide left behind uh, uh, after they abandoned in 84 and they had dumped a lot of toxic waste in and around the factory. Uh, in the communities where more than 50,000 people live now. So the groundwater of these communities have been ha- heavily contaminated by, uh, you know, by lead, mercury, and several, or, uh, uh, several chemicals that cause cancer, brain damage, birth defects in children. So we have a population of about 50,000 people that drank contaminated water, and there are several children who are being born with birth defects. Um, you know, so the, these are just the, some of the health impacts that we are talking about and the impact to the environment. But also, if you look at it legally, 
25,000 people died and so many people continue to suffer and there is not a single corporation single individual that has paid for this uh, 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 you know for, uh, for this travesty so uh, corporations like Dow Chemical and Union Carbide uh, continue to run free continue to do business uh, freely while they have killed and maimed and injured uh, thousands and thousands of people in, in Bhopal. We are doing a petition in which we would like people in U.S. to sign. It's a U.S. government petition uh, which asks basically that Department of Justice stop shielding Dow Chemical. And we have this petition on the whitehouse.gov site. So if people are interested, please, please sign and ensure that there is an end to this 32-year-old tragedy that still continues in Bhopal. Well, the search for justice continues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hems had a role in almost every chapter of American history. It was actually illegal for early colonists of Jamestown to not grow hemp because our founding fathers were enthusiastic hemp farmers. And even the Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper. And when Americans moved west, they took hemp-covered wagons onto new frontiers. And when the gold rush hit, the 49ers even wore hemp Levi dungarees as they sought their fortunes. And in 1938, popular mechanics named it America's new billion dollar crop, noting its many uses and how easy farmers find it to grow. The magazine added, it can be grown in any state of the union. Yet it wasn't long before this last fact was no longer true. So what happened exactly that made hemp disappear? Unfortunately for the hemp industry, industrial hemp cultivation is blocked by the same draconian drug laws which outlaw marijuana possession and consumption. Hemp and marijuana are different varieties of the same species of plant, cannabis sativa L, and they're grown for different purposes. Marijuana is the flowering tops and leaves of psychoactive varieties of cannabis that are grown for their high THC content. And hemp is the low THC oilseed and fiber varieties of cannabis, which is grown for their seeds and fiber. Marijuana is classed as a Schedule I drug by the federal government along with heroin. Now, the U.S. is one of the only few industrialized nations to ban hemp cultivation. So even though hemp can clothe, house, and nourish us, even though hemp can be used to make vehicles that won't choke landfills with rusting metal, and even though it can help to clean polluted soil for future crop growth, Americans are often unable to maximize their use of the centuries-old plant. Now here to explain why the federal government continues to keep hemp out of American fields is Eric Steenstra, president of Vote Hemp, a grassroots advocacy group that's leading the charge to bring hemp farming back in the United States. Check it out. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining me today. I'd like you to explain to our viewers, I mean, how exactly did we go um, from Jamestown, where it was completely illegal to not grow hemp, um, to the government's own World War II era hemp for victory program to blanket prohibition? Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story, but uh, I mean, yeah, so obviously the United States had a long history from, you know, colonial times, so I mean, from really from the beginnings of the country, with using hemp as a resource, and it was a very important uh, resource, uh, you know, uh, really uh, in American agriculture going back, like I said, going back to the founding. The founding fathers grew it, and uh, what ended up happening was in the 1930s when there was a push towards um, uh, banning marijuana, um, hemp got caught up in that. At that time, there was no, they had no... Um, no real understanding of what the uh, in, what what it was in in the cannabis plant that caused uh, people to have this euphoric high feeling, and so um, the hemp the, the you know even though when they had hearings in Congress, uh, there were people that stood up and said, uh, well, we need to still be able to grow hemp, and they they were assured that they could. Uh, eventually, that policy led to what we have today, and finally, the, sort of the final nail in the coffin was in 1970 when the Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act. And at that time, they put uh, marijuana in the most restrictive uh, schedule, uh, which didn't allow for any, any use, uh, you know, except for research under, like, strict license from the DEA. And uh, at that point, they did not distinguish between uh, varieties of cannabis that were grown for industrial purposes and, and uh 
drug type varieties of cannabis. So hemp got, you know, got lost there. And, you know, that's where we are today. It's basically how we got here today. So Right. And I'm glad you talked about that because states are now um, increasingly moving to define hemp as distinct from marijuana and to encourage industrial hemp, hemp cultivation in research settings because of activism and, you know, just information about this. So why does the federal government continue, though, to deliberately curtail industrial hemp cultivation efforts by lumping it into the Schedule I uh, category with marijuana? Well, you know, like I said, Congress put, uh, you know, define marijuana broadly and then put it in this uh, drug control you know, scheme that uh, involved these schedules and whatnot. And, and you know, so we, we had a breakthrough in, in 2014. Uh, the president signed some new legislation from Congress that allowed for pilot programs and research uh, under the Farm Bill. And so for the first time in, in many decades, we've, we've seen some of those pilot programs taking place in a number of states around the country, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, Colorado, Indiana, uh, you know, North Dakota, Hawaii, a number of states have participated last year, and more will be involved this year. But uh, basically, those are still not uh, the, the law still doesn't allow for commercial cultivation. And so, what we really need at this point to change that is Congress uh, needs to pass some pending legislation. We do have a bill in the uh, bill in the House and a bill in the Senate, virtually identical bills uh, that have pretty strong uh, bipartisan support, but we just haven't been able to get to move them forward yet to get a hearing and actually uh, have a chance to have a vote on them. We do have some movement in terms of uh, getting some more support for the bills. Uh, our bill in uh, the Senate, uh, which is uh, S-134, sponsored by Senator Wyden and co-sponsored by uh, Majority Leader Senator McConnell and a number of other members of the Senate, has now has 14 co-sponsors. So that's 14 out of, you know, the 100 senators. And then in the House, our bill there, H.R. 525, which is sponsored by Representative Massey from Kentucky and uh, has uh, now 69 co-sponsors, including uh, 25 or 26 Republicans and 47 Democrats. So it's got broad bipartisan support. But, you know, in the Congress today, you know, things are still pretty polarized. There's not a lot of legislation that moves. And so we have to find the right opportunity when, you know, we can move the bill forward. We still don't have... Uh, haven't, haven't found the right opportunity. So we're, we're hopeful that'll happen in the very near future. In the past couple of years, there's obviously been a major movement, um, a public movement around marijuana legalization with more and more states legalizing marijuana for recreational and uh, medical use. Um, has this movement, in your opinion, had any impact on efforts to promote industrial hemp cultivation on U.S. soil? Um, yeah, I, I do. I do think that the you know the fact that that we're as a nation we're looking at cannabis policy generally has helped to move things forward for hemp because hemp has been you know hemp hemp policy has been intertwined with marijuana policy. So I think the fact that states and uh, and federal government have been taking a look at this has been helpful. Well, like with any movement, there's always going to be some special interest trying to block it. Um, ultimately, who has the most to lose from the federal government's blocks um, on industrial hemp cultivation? I mean, who are the corporations? Who are the special interest groups? And who has the most to gain? Well, you know, farmers and industry have the most to gain. As far as who has the most to lose, you know, honestly, I think there's a perception within the DEA that somehow this is this is a loss for them because they're losing control over some portion of cannabis. But I think it's, it's really, no, you know, no loss there at all. I think that, uh, you know, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not really sure that there's, there's anyone that really loses from this. So, you know, I, I think it's a big plus for, you know, for the United States. Like I said, American farmers will gain, uh, American businesses will gain and, uh, it, you know, it'd be beneficial for the long term for the U.S. You know, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful, and I know that, you know, you're putting a lot of effort into making this happen, but what are some of the most promising things on the horizon for hemp in the United States? Is America's billion-dollar crop uh, making a comeback? Sure. I mean, well, if, you know, so right now we have, uh, you know, more than half a billion dollars worth of uh, products that you know, being sold at retail that are coming from imports, right? So uh, we've got imports coming from Canada and from Europe and from China, and um, all those, uh, you know, farmers in those countries are able to grow hemp and, you know, produce products and then ship them into the United States. Uh, you know, right now, you know, we, we, what, 
it makes no sense at all that American farmers are being denied the ability to grow a crop that we've historically had grown for, you know, for centuries that has so many beneficial uses. I mean, we're talking about nutritious foods, um, you know, body care. Uh, we're talking about, you know, car parts. We're talking about building materials. We're talking about clothing, uh, energy. We're talking about, you know, just a, a really incredibly diverse plant. I mean, the, uh, that, you know, that has a lot of uses and it can be grown in all 50 states. Uh, we don't have, you know, we have only one fiber crop in the United States really right now, and that's cotton. It can only be grown in certain states. It's not, uh, not sustainable, environmentally friendly. If, you know, hemp would, hemp would be an alternative fiber for many uses there. The seed has a really nutritious profile. It's got a, you know, great balance of omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acids. Those are the good fats that doctors recommend for, for health. Uh, has a, you know, um, a full, a complete protein and a number of other nutrients in it. Um, you know, there's just so much that can potentially be done. Even, uh, uh they're now, the, in the Europe, Europe, they figured out a way to build, uh, a, a homes using hempcrete, which is a material that uses the core of the stock mixed with lime to produce a sustainable, natural material that has incredible insulative properties and, um, you know, so there's just so many different things that could potentially be done with this, and um, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that uh, that American companies have to import it and that American farmers aren't able to participate in the market. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for joining me today. President of Vote Hemp, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you again for joining me today. You can check me out on Facebook and on Twitter at Minar, M-U-H, where I'll continue to go behind the headline until our next episode next week. See you then.